Today we have uh, Noemi Jacquier uh, with us. She's a postdoctoral researcher uh, at Kazuo Institute of Technology. Uh, she recently acquired her PhD uh, in 2020 uh, at Lausanne. And she has been working on Bayesian optimization, particularly in the field, applying it to uh, robotics. And yeah, we are very excited to hear what you have to say to us today. Um, okay. please, please do start with the talk. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me for this talk. I'm really glad uh, to be here today with all of you. Uh, thank you also for the introduction. And um, yeah, so today I want to tell you about Bayesian optimization on Riemann and manifolds um, for robot learning. Um, so first of all, why Bayesian optimization for robot learning? So um, the idea in robot manipulation is that we often have skills um, where we need the robot to be very precise or to be, for example, very stiff or compliant in some directions. Um, and moreover, we would like the robot to be able to um, cope with the uncertainty that are naturally arising in those tasks, and also to be able to adapt and to generalize to new situation. So if you take the example here on the left, we have this begin hole um, insertion task. So if we change the orientation of the hole, we would like the robot to still be able to perform the insertion. Uh, on the right side, we have uh, this stiffness adaptation. And in that case, we may need to adapt the stiffness along the execution of the task in order to be uh, able to actually uh, perform this insertion successfully. So in robotic uh, control controllers, uh, policy parameters often have to be refined and adapted. Um, on top of this, because we are working with real robots, so those are real systems, uh, each trial that we are doing is actually very costly. Uh, also, we have some safety requirements, so we cannot just uh, do some trials that may break the robot. So in general, we are aiming for safe, fast, and data-efficient learning processes. Um, so Bayesian optimization is actually a method that uh, fulfills all those criteria, and that's why we like uh, to use it for robot learning. Um, so I think in both the BO and the robotics community, we are always trying to go for more uh, data-efficient learning processes. So in BO, this can be done by exploiting domain knowledge, so adding some additional inductive bias into our BO algorithm. So this has been done in robotics in several contexts, such as uh, controller tuning, uh, here for bipedal locomotions, on, and for general behavior adaptation in case uh, where the robot is actually breaking. Um, so one thing that was actually overlooked in all those different um, works is that they never considered the geometry of the search space. Um, so why I'm telling you about geometry here is simply because we have a lot of relevant robotic parameters that have different geometries, which are very important and can be exploited further in the view. Um, so first of all, for some examples, we have the classical Euclidean space. Um, so this is the one that is used in most Bayesian optimization algorithm that you can find in literature. So in robotics, we use it to present the positions of the end effector, but also the forces and the torques that we apply on the robot. Um, then we have spaces that have more particular geometries. So for example, we have the sphere that we use to represent orientation and in general directional data. So this is uh, in general for unit norm data actually. Uh, in robotics, we use a lot the space of symmetric positive definite matrices. So it helps us to define controller gains but also inertia matrices for the robots and for the objects, and also manipulability ellipsoids. At other spaces, we have the torus in which uh, the joint configuration are intrinsically lying, and we can also use this to represent periodic function. Um, we have the special orthogonal group, which is another way to represent orientation, and we use also uh, as building blocks for other um, geometry data, such as the SPD matrices, if you use the eigenvalue decomposition. And finally, we have that hyperbolic space, which we use to embed graph and trace data. So you see here, you have a lot of different geometries, and the idea would be to be able to use those in order to improve the data efficiency of our BO. So this is why we designed uh, this geometry over Bayesian optimization techniques. Uh, so this is the acronym GABO. Um, 
so this is just a short introduction on BO. So I know that most of you should actually be um, familiar with that. Uh, so I will do very fast here, but it's just to put everybody uh, in the same point to start the talk. Um, so with Bayesian optimization, we are aiming at optimizing a function for which uh, we can observe the value of this function at any point, but we don't have um, an easy closed form solution of this function. So we don't typically know uh, the gradients of this function at each point. Um, so the idea here is given some observation, we model this objective function typically with the quotient process. So we have here the prior and the posterior that gives us uh, the model of our objective function. And then based on this quotient process, we can define an acquisition function to evaluate the utility of candidate points. So um, this acquisition function solves the exploration exploration trade-off. So by maximizing this acquisition function, we find our next query point and um, then we iterate. And usually the PO is very data efficient in finding the minimum of our function. So what I would like you to observe here is actually that there is two important steps in this BO if we want that we need to modify if we want to go towards a geometry work algorithm. So the first point is that we have this Gaussian process that we use to model uh, our objective function, which is fully specified by the mean and the covariance matrix or the kernel. So the mean usually is simply um, a constant. So here we keep it like this. And kernels, um, so this is one of the typical kernel that we use um, in the Gaussian process field. So this is the uh, squared exponential kernel. And you see that this squared exponential kernel um, is defined based on the Euclidean distance between two data points. Now, if we take those data that have particular geometries and we use this distance function, we actually have an issue. So you see here, um, if we want to measure the distance on the earth and we simply take the Euclidean distance, we measure the distance going through the earth. Um, so this is not a good way to measure a distance on a sphere. So what we propose here is actually to modify this kernel function in order to take the geometry of our data into account. So in our case, to take the distance which makes us go on the surface of the Earth. So this is the distance that we would like to measure when we are traveling. Um, so our kernel will be then a function of this distance, and we have then a geometry of our formulation of that kernel. Um, the second important point that we need to modify to be geometry aware in our BO algorithm is um, the optimization of the acquisition function. So we know that the quality of the next query is heavily depending on how well we are able to optimize this acquisition function. So again, in the Euclidean case, we simply optimize the acquisition function as um, in a subset of the Euclidean space. However, if you have data that have specific geometry, so again, the example of the earth, you actually have to add some constraints in order to ensure that your data are respecting your geometry. Um, so what we propose here is instead of having this constraint optimization is to directly optimize our acquisition function on our specific geometry in a geometry of our formulation so that we have an unconstrained optimization. So these are basically the two points on which we need to work in order to have Bayesian optimization um, for data that have those specific geometries. Now, in order to do so, we also need like a geometric framework that we can exploit to modify our kernel and to modify this optimization of the acquisition function. Um, so in that case, we use the Riemannian manifold theory simply because all the geometrical space that I showed you before, all of them are Riemannian manifold. So to give you an intuition what a Riemannian manifold is, it's uh, simply a space that is curved, but if you zoom close enough, this space is gonna look like the Euclidean space. So what this allows you to do is to define a tension space at each point on your manifold, which is Euclidean itself. And um, this tension space can be then exploited in order to define some important properties of our manifold. So what we define on it is um, an inner product um, which contains this Riemannian matrix, so this matrix J that you can see here. And um, this matrix is going to actually define how curved our manifold is along. Um, so the curvature related quantities of our manifold along the full space. And also it will allow us to define some distances on the manifold 
and some maps that I will show you after that are useful to optimize the acquisition function. So this Riemannian metric is actually smoothly varying along the manifold. So this is an important property to have um, a manifold that is actually Riemannian. And um, based on this, we can then define distances and curves on this manifold. So an important point here is to define the geodesic curve, which is here represented by the red line. So this is the, the shortest path on the manifold. So this is the equivalent of straight line in Euclidean space. And as you can see here, the geodesic are actually different from the Euclidean line. So they stay on the surface of the manifold, but the Euclidean don't care about the geometry of the manifold. So this is the type of line that we use then to measure distances. So here, basically, we are going to use our Riemannian metric and those geodesic curves in order to define our kernels. And now I'm going to here define some few more tools that we will use after for the optimization of the acquisition function. Um, so the first one is the exponential map, which uh, projects a vector on the tension space to a point on the manifold, such that the length of um, the manifold curve and the vector are the same. And then we have the inverse map, which is called logarithmic map, which projects a point from the manifold to the tension space. So the, the important point of those maps is actually that they're going to allow us to move points from the manifold to the tension space, where we can do the classical Euclidean operation. And after doing our operation that we need on the tension space, we project back our res results on the manifold. And the last tool that we're going to use later is called parallel transport. So it allows us to move vectors from one tension space to another, such that the angles, so the inner product between those vectors is actually conserved. So this is kind of the basic of Riemannian geometry that you, know, you need to kind of know to then understand the generalization that we do for the kernel and the optimization of the acquisition function to the manifold. So as I told you, we're going to use the Riemannian metric and the geodesic distance for the kernel and the exponential logarithmic map and parallel transport operation for the optimization of the acquisition function. OK, so based on these tools, we can now go for a first um, generalization of our squared exponential kernel to remain a manifold. Um, so here on the slide, I call it a first naive generalization. Um, this is indeed because it's a naive generalization, and I present it here to you because this is the first generalization that we made a couple of years ago in the first work that we had about Bayesian optimization on manifolds. So um, I'm going to first show you this naive generalization and the results that we obtained based on this, and then I will show you how we can actually do better and have a full generalization of those kernels. So for this first naive generalization, what we simply did was to replace the Euclidean distance by the geodesic distance in the formulation of the squared exponential kernel. So it means that on the sphere, instead of measuring the distance according to the blue line, we measure the distance according to the red line, which is our geodesic. So our shortest path, which is respecting the, the geometry of our manifold. Um, so the issue with that formulation is that actually it's not positive definite for all the values of the inverse length scale parameter beta. Um, however, here we can explore the fact that um, the minimum eigenvalue function is monotonic with respect to the value of beta. So it means that we can find a beta mean, so a minimum value, such that for all the value of beta that are higher than these beta mean values, the kernel is guaranteed to be positive definite. And we can simply determine this vitamin in an experimental manner. So to do this, we simply generate some points on the manifold, we sample them, then we compute the kernel for those points, and we check for um, which beta, and we have all the, um, the eigenvalues of our kernel that are positive. Uh, so you can see here, um, so this is the minimum uh, eigen. Uh, so this is the curve that is telling us the minimum eigenvalue of our kernel, and this is the percentage of kernel that are positive definite according to the value of beta that is here. 
Um, so the idea here is that you do several sampling of points, you compute several kernel, and then you take beta min as the value of beta, such that all the kernels are positive definite. And then for all values of beta that are higher than that, you have positive definite kernels. Um, so this is for the kernel. Now for the second point, so to have a geometry aware optimization of the function. Yes, sorry. Can you hear us? Uh, yes. Can I ask you a question? Is that yes. all right? Of course. Uh, um, this beta mean, mm -hmm. what does this depend on? I guess it depends on the manifold. Does it also depend on the distribution of your data? Yeah, exactly. So it depends. Um, you have to compute it for each manifold and for each dimension of your manifold. So here the 6.5 is for the sphere S2, so the one that you have here. But if you go to higher dimension, you have to compute again this vitamin. And if you change manifold, you have to compute it as well. All right, thank you. And what's the influence of the number of points that you use to compute the, the matrix? Um, so if you have only a few points, you may have some errors. Then as long as you have, like, just go for a lot of points, then usually you're fine. So you have to more or less cover your space, as you can see here in the picture. OK, thanks. Thanks. Any other question at that point before I move on? OK. Um, so yeah, this is for our kernel. So then the second point is how to optimize our acquisition function in a geometry aware manner. Um, so the idea here is to use optimization methods on women and manifolds. So um, there have been a lot of approaches um, that have been generalizing optimization methods on Euclidean space to Riemannian manifolds in the last year. So you can refer to the book that is referred um, at the bottom of the slide for this. And um, here I just want to take the example of the conjugate gradient descent on manifolds because it's actually simple to illustrate and it's nice to explain. Um, but in practice, you can go for more complex methods. So now we are typically using trust regions methods to optimize these acquisition functions. So the idea behind this conjugate gradient descent is that um, you want to solve um, the argmin of, so you want to find the minimum of minus the acquisition function, basically. You want to maximize the acquisition function, so you minimize minus the acquisition function. Um, so here on the left, you have an example of a function. So this is a very simple function. So the more you go towards yellow, the lower the value of the function. So the optimum is here given by the X star. And for our gradient descent, we actually start with an iterate, which is uh, laying on the manifold. So this is the red point. Um, and you have a search direction, which is giving, given by a vector on the tangent space of our initial iterate. So once you have this, you want um, to basically find the next iterate. So you want to do your gradient descent on this manifold. Um, so to do this, uh, what you do is that you first solve a line search problem. So this is similar to what you do in Euclidean space. But in that case, uh, your line search problem is defined on the tension space of your iterate. And you find this alpha k, which is giving you how far along your search direction you actually have to go to get your next iterate. And now, because we are still on the tangent space, we need to project this onto the manifold by using this exponential map that I showed you before in order to get our next iterate. So once we have this next iterate, what we aim at is to find the next search direction. Um, so the idea here is that first, you need to move your old search direction into the tangent space of your new iterate. So for this, we are using the parallel transport operator that I showed you before. Then you want to combine this old search direction by the gradient of the function at your next iterate. So you compute this gradient, which is a vector that is also laying on the tangent space of this iterate. Then you can combine both of them um, in a weighted some manner, and you get actually your new search direction on the tangent space of your new iterate. And then you iteratively do this process again and again until you converged. And basically, your next query point is equal to the results of your optimization on the manifold. OK. 
so now basically we have those two tools that we need um, to have our geometry over Bayesian optimization. So I will show you some first results that we had a couple of years ago um, with this GABO on benchmark function. Um, so here we are considering the Ackley function on the sphere. So you see here the function that has been projected on the sphere and the star denotes uh, the minimum that we are aiming at reaching. And I will show you also some uh, 2D projection of um, how the Gaussian process is looking like on the sphere. So on the 2D projection you have here, uh, those are two axes of our sphere, so x1 and x2 here. And vertically you have the value of uh, the function. So what I want to show you here, uh, so this is again our optimum. Uh, so I want to show you actually the evolution of the Gaussian process on the sphere. So the mean here on the sphere and based on those projection, the mean and the variance of the Gaussian process. So the variance is given here by this uh, gray envelope and the mean is here the colored uh, zone. So we have again um, our optimum denoted by this star and here in blue, you have the current optimum according to um, the Gaussian process model. And you will see also here um, the current best value of um, the BO, um, yeah, that the BO found on the, this optimization problem. So here you see uh, the evolution of the GP mean and the evolution of the optimum by the BO. So you see that actually very fast, it goes close to the optimum of this function and then it explores. And you can also see that the variance of the Gaussian process is reduced by the exploration uh, on those 2D projection. So after this, we can have a look at some convergence statistics. So I let it run a second time. So you see here again, we reached the optimum around at around 20 iteration, and then we reduce the variance. And at the end of the day, the shape of the function looks actually very close to the the ground truth we have on the left. So um, in terms of convergence statistics, so we compared the performance of GABO with uh, simply the Euclidean BO, so it's the vanilla BO with a squared exponential kernel and a constrained optimization of the acquisition function to be on the sphere. And you see that here for the sphere uh, S2, the GABO is actually converging to a better optimum and in a faster manner than this Euclidean Bayesian optimization. Then we studied the same problem for higher dimension. So here we are on the sphere of dimension four. And you see that by increasing the dimension, the difference between the two approaches is even um, stronger. So here the Euclidean view has uh, actually a very high variance um, and doesn't converge in 75 iteration. Um, what is also interesting here is that we can push the problem in even higher dimension so here we go to uh, the sphere of dimension 50. And uh, we compared here also with some high dimensional Bayesian optimization approaches. So the CRBO and the dropout that you can see there. And you can see that actually GABO, so just considering the geometry of your problem is allowing you to outperform even the performance of those high dimensional BO methods. Um, so we are here and you see that all others have they don't find the same optimum and some of them really have a high variance. Can I ask you a quick question? Sure. sure. So in the middle one, so uh, the Euclidean BO sometimes finds a solution that's better than any of the ones that GABO find. Um, so I think here the, the actually the, the variance is a bit um, misleading somehow. Um, so I don't think that you find better solution. It's just that uh, the variance is plotted a bit big. It's also asymmetric. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, also the long because, because of the long scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. long scale. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, so in conclusion, um, by using the geometry, we obtain faster convergence, better accuracy, and lower solution variance. Um, so we studied again this GABO with this naive kernel on some other benchmark functions. So here for the Ackley function uh, on the symmetric positive definite manifold. Uh, so here you have the function represented inside the manifold. So just to give you an idea, um, this actually denotes the space of symmetric matrices. So two by two symmetric matrices where you have a di diagonal elements that are represented uh, here horizontally 
and the off diagonal element, which is uh, the same as it's symmetric, is the vertical axis. And the matrices that are positive definite are actually inside this cone. So this is the space that we are taking into account. Um, so again, I will show you the evolution of the GP mean on this manifold. So the optimum is again, uh, this green star. And here uh, you will just see the, the color of the mean on the query data point, because it's actually hard to see anything if you put the color in the full manifold here. Um, so here we have the evolution of the Bayesian optimization. So you see that very fast, we also go close to the optimum value. And then we have uh, some more exploration. Um, and after around 35, 40 iteration, we actually are really close to the minimum of the function. So again, some convergence statistics. So in that case, we compared GABO with uh, the Euclidean Bayesian optimization and also with the, what we call Cholesky uh, Bayesian optimization. So it's simply you use the Cholesky decomposition of the SPD matrix and you apply the Euclidean BO on this Cholesky decomposition. So on the L matrix that we have here. And we see here again that GABO converges actually faster and usually outperforms uh, those Euclidean methods, especially in this case, the Cholesky one. Um, so now I showed you some benchmark. And so our goal is to do some, some robotics. So here is a, a robotic experiments where we applied GABO for a direct policy search a scenario. So our goal here was to adapt the stiffness of the robot so we have uh, this uh, Franca robot here, and uh, his goal is to reach uh, this point P, which is an effector, so to go from here to this point P here. And we are perturbing it with an external force, which is unknown to the robot. So this is the force that you can see here. And the idea here is that, um, so the stiffness of the robot controls like how stiff the robot is. So somehow how resistant to the external perturbation the robot can be. But at the same time, uh, for safety reason, we don't like to have a robot that is too stiff. So we would like it to have as compliant as possible, but still able to cope with this external perturbation and reach um, the point P that we have here. So here, our objective function is basically to minimize the error with the desired position P hat. To do this with low joint torques, so to be compliant in the process. And we also add a reward if we reach the desired position. So I will show you here um, the evaluations of this GABO on this problem. So it goes very fast. So you have to observe that at the beginning, um, GABO actually queries some stiffness that are very high. So the robot is going in a very stiff manner. So in a very fast manner from the initial position to uh, the desired position. And after some few iteration, uh, the BO finds some better solutions. So the robot still manages to reach the desired position but it does it in a very smoother manner. So with the more compliant behavior. So you see that now it goes very fast at the beginning. And after some few iteration, it finds some better solution, which allows it to go compliantly and to the desired position. And this is the best that we find after 50 iterations. So you can clearly here see the difference compared to the run that was at the beginning. So again, some convergence statistics uh, compared to the two Euclidean based optimization techniques that we have there. And we see that again, uh, GABO converges uh, faster to better optimum and also with lower solution variance. Okay. So for this first part of the talk, I showed you the idea behind this geometry aware Bayesian optimization process. So the idea was to have a uh, geometry over squared exponential kernel, which is based on this naive generalization, and to optimize the acquisition function directly on the Riemannian manifold with Riemannian optimization methods. Um, so you can see here that despite the fact that we have this naive generalization, we actually have really nice results that show us that taking the geometry into account really helps. Um, however, this naive generalization of the kernel still remains limited. So for example, uh, as we have this vitamin, it means that we are not able to represent functions that are varying in a slow manner. Um, so this is typically the limit of what we can have on the sphere S2. We cannot represent functions that are varying more slowly than this. 
And uh, because of that, actually, this generalization is limited and it doesn't fully capture the manifold geometry. So the question is, is how can we do better than this? So what I want to talk to you about in the second part is how can we um, get general formulation, not only for squared exponential, but also for matter kernel on Riemann manifolds. Okay, um, so what I'm going to present now is based on the Nuris paper by Borowitzki and all. So it's the reference that you can see here at the bottom of the slide. Um, so the idea behind this proper Riemannian generalization is that we consider, I mean, we view the, the squared exponential kernel from another point of view. So namely, we see it as um, the covariance of a random process, which is satisfying the stochastic partial differential equation that you have here on the right. Um, so in this stochastic partial differential equation, we have W, which is the white noise. And uh, this delta is the, the Laplacian operator. So the idea is that if you solve this equation and you obtain the random process F, and then you compute the covariance of this process, you obtained your squared exponential kernel. And what this new paper is uh, proposing is to generalize this to compact Riemannian manifold and simply by replacing the white noise by the white noise with respect to the Riemannian metric. So the white noise on the Riemannian manifold and by using instead of the Laplacian to use its generalization to Riemannian manifold, which is called Laplace Beltrami operator. And the idea here is that you solve this equation, you get the covariance of your process and this is the kind of solution that you obtain. So this is basically infinite sum, which is based on the Laplace Beltrami eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. And for many of the Riemannian manifold that we are considering, we actually know, or we can obtain those Laplace Beltrami eigenvalues and eigenfunction. And then based on this infinite theory, we obtain the kernel for our manifold. And so here you can see the sum of the Laplace Beltrami eigenfunctions for the sphere. Um, I mean, for the circle, based on this um, Neurips paper of Boris and colleagues. Um, so in practice, we have here those infinite sum. You can simply take like the 10, 21st terms, and actually this is sufficient uh, to have a precise kernel for what we need. Um, so those kernels are actually valid for those compact manifolds. So this is the sphere, the SO, and the torus manifold, mostly in the ones that I presented you before. And intuitively, what it means is that it's manifolds that have a boundary and that are containing boundaries. So these are the ones that we call compact. Um, following the same idea, we can also generalize the matter and kernel to remain in manifolds. So this is uh, the formulation here where k is, um, no, sorry, k is the length scale and nu is the smoothness parameter. So you can choose your new value. Um, as in Euclidean space, so you can have 0 0.5, 1.5, 2.5, etc. And um, you solve this infinite sum and you obtain your matter and kernel. Um, so what is interesting here is that actually this is equivalent to generalize the Mercer theorem to the Riemannian case. So this is the Mercer uh, theorem in the Euclidean case, where the kernel is given as a sum of eigenvalues and eigenfunction of a given finite measure space. And actually, in the Riemann case, you have um, Laplace Beltrami eigenvalues and eigenfunction instead, and um, you have a function around the eigenvalues. So it's not only the eigenvalues, but um, this kind of exponential or power uh, formulation. Um, so now, what is interesting to see is what actually was the naive generalization doing. Um, so to check that, I take the example um, also from this paper of the squared exponential kernel on a circle. So intuitively, this is the naive generalization. So we have here this distance that is um, the geodesic distance from the manifold, and this corresponds to measuring the distance here between our x and y point on this circle manifold. Now what the proper generalization does is that we have this infinite theory here, and this considers basically all the paths between x and x prime here that we can have. So we consider also the full turn, uh, you do a full tour of the circle and then you go until your second point. 
So what we can see here is that actually our naive generalization corresponds to the first term of our summation. So locally, it is somehow correct. So this explains actually why it already um, performs really well in terms of BO compared to Euclidean approaches. Okay, so as I told you, the, the framework that I just showed you is actually not valid for non-compact manifolds. So we still want to have some formulation of those kernels for spaces such as the symmetric positive definite matrices space or the hyperbolic manifold. So now the question is how can we get those as E and matern kernel? So the idea that we explored here in uh, this recent court paper is that we actually have in the literature some heat kernels that are already available for some of those spaces. Um, so heat kernels that are satisfying this equation on the manifold. And then we can simply exploit the link between the squared exponential kernel and the heat kernel, namely that is a rescaled and reparameterized version. And then we simply obtain our squared exponential kernel in that way. And then in terms of matern kernel, we exploited the fact that matern kernel can be expressed as integrals of squared exponential kernel. So you integrate here over the length scale of the squared exponential kernel um, according to the smoothness that you want for your matern kernel. And you can obtain here the matern kernel for any smoothness space on your SE kernel. Um, so this is what we use for non-compact manifolds. Um, so based on those kernels, we now have a completely geometrical aware uh, or Riemannian framework for Bayesian optimization. So now we applied again this GABO framework with this new uh, formulation of kernels on some benchmark functions. Uh, so the first one is um, the Levy function here on the sphere. Um, so what you see here is again the convergence uh, in depending on the number of evaluation. And here is the distribution of the minima uh, after 200 iteration. So here, the Riemannian kernels are the orange one here and the blue one here. So the blue one is the matern and this one is the SE. And the purple one is the naive generalization. So here you see that actually almost all of them are performing similarly. So the naive generalization is slightly slower at this location, but finally they converge well. And they actually converge better than the two Euclidean ones, which are here with the dashed lines. Um, some other benchmark functions. So this is the Ackley function on the hyperbolic space. And again, you see that here, those two Riemannian kernels are outperforming their Euclidean counterparts uh, for the BO. Um, some other benchmarks. So this one is on the um, special orthogonal group and this one on the symmetric positive definite manifolds. So um, here, this is a case where actually the naive kernel is performing really well. So this purple one, and it's actually even outperforming uh, the Riemannian kernel. So this is one of those a bit strange cases uh, where this naive kernel is actually performing really well. So summarizing, uh, those Riemannian kernels also allow us to go for a faster convergence, the better accuracy, and a lower solution variance. So now moving for some robotics experiments. So we first used uh, GABO for optimizing uh, manipulable ellipsoids. So manipulable ellipsoids in robotics is um, symmetric positive definite matrices. So there are ellipsoids, as you can see here, and they indicate us the ability of the robot to move along all the directions in the task space. So what it means is that the robot is gonna be able to apply a high velocity along the main axis of this ellipsoid here. And here it will be able to apply only a lower velocity. So this is what this manipulability is telling us. So the experiment that we consider here is an experiment with a planar robot. So this is the, the black robot that you see here, which is going downwards this line with um, following the line with a certain velocity. And the idea here is that we would like the robot to achieve this trajectory in a smooth manner. So with the low and the factor jerk. And to do this, we can help him by, um, by telling him to take a posture that is allowing him to apply a high velocity in the direction here of the motion. 
So we are basically aiming at finding a manipulable ellipsoid. This is the green one that we can track so that the robot has um, a low jerk and can go fast downwards this direction. So this is the formula of the controller. Um, the idea is simply that the robot is uh, so tracking this line with the given velocity and tracking this desired manipulability ellipsoid. So you see here the, the current one of the robot is the purple one. So we here have this objective function where we want the robot to achieve this trajectory with the low and the fractal jerk. Um, we want to have a manipulability that aligns with the motion direction. And ideally, we also want a desired manipulability such that it can be tracked by the robot. Because if we have a desired manipulability that the robot cannot achieve, it doesn't help us. Um, so here you see several iterations of the task. So this robot is going down um, along that line. And you see that at the beginning, the manipulability are actually too big and the robot is not able to track them. So then after several iterations, we actually get manipulability that are easier to track, such as um, now. So the robot is able to track it at the beginning and at the end, and it achieves um, smoother and smoother motions. So I'll just leave it some few more iterations. You can see um, a bit what the, the view is exploring. Um, so you see here that we are somehow in a plateau and we had some exploration. And um, after 100 iteration, this is what we obtain. So you can see here that we have a smooth motion. Uh, the manipulability is somehow aligned with the direction of motion. It is longer in the vertical axis than in the horizontal one. And the robot is able mostly to track it during the full iteration. In terms of convergent statistics, um, so here is what we obtain over 30 trials. So we have here in orange, this is the Riemannian kernel. And uh, in purple, this is um, the naive generalization. And here you have the Euclidean and the Cholesky Bayesian optimization as showed previously. So you can see here that um, the Riemannian kernel is the one achieving the best convergence with also the lower variance, but the naive generalization is also not that bad in that case. Okay, um, at the second experiment on another space, uh, we here investigate GABO for path planning by exploiting the hyperbolic manifold. So the idea here is that uh, we have a point robot that goes from this starting position until the end position here. Um, the idea is that we have this environment that is made of a grid and we have this obstacle here that the robot has to avoid. So our goal is to actually find a path that is short and that avoids collision with that obstacle. Um, so the idea here is to actually embed this grid into the hyperbolic space. So this is what you see here. Because this is an, a more efficient representation of the grid in this uh, problem. Um, so you can see that here, the red points on the grid are corresponding to the red point here on the hyperbolic space. Um, and the same for all the colors of the grid. We have here our starting point, here the end point, and those four points here are the ones that are at the border here of the obstacle. So our goal here is to find uh, five nodes for the path in the hyperbolic space, and then we project them back in our Euclidean space, and you see the nodes are uh, the ones that are there. So we go straight from the start to the first node and straight to the second node, etc. And we want to find the best position for those five nodes in order to have a short collision free pass. So here you see again uh, the iteration of the BO. So at the beginning, we are really crossing the obstacle. And at some point, it starts finding some paths that are collision free. Uh, still a bit long sometimes, but uh, yeah, we get better in the results with still some exploration. And um, after 100 iteration, and this is what we obtain. So we have here this path, which is collision free, and that is almost optimal in terms of length. Um, in terms of convergence statistics, so you see in that case that the, uh, the Riemannian SE kernel, the orange one, is outperforming all the others. Um, in that case, the Riemannian Matern kernel performs more or less as the Euclidean counterparts. Um, 
So this is for that specific problem, basically, where the scored exponential kernel is performing uh, better. OK. Poincaré represent. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, where is the Poincaré space well suited for this problem? Um, so the idea is here that you can. Um, so the, the idea of this Poincaré space is that the further you go from uh, the center, the more distance you have between the points. And uh, here we wanted to represent that um, those points in red are close to each other. So you can see it here in the Poincaré. Um, and they are actually very far from the blue ones, which you can see here, and they're in the other side of that. Um, so yeah, this is, this is basically why, to better take into account the distances uh, in our grid space. So what does the color stand for? Uh, the color is just to show the different points of the grid, to show the correspondence between the two spaces. OK. And why are the red points closer? Like the, you, you just said that the corner of the space, the, the two red ones are closer than a red and a blue. Why yeah, did you exactly. say that? Um, so because if, if you take the geodesics in the hyperbolic space, um, they go along those red points here. And yeah. this is kind of. So what you have in the other side is kind of what you can have the, the further from those red points. So the, the, the point that you can have the further from this point here is actually the one in the opposite of the grid. And those are again along the geodesic, so they are considered as close to each other. Does that make any sense? Yeah, but we, we see the same thing on the left, right? Yes. Um, yeah, but then if you consider really the intrinsic distance of that space, they are not the same as these ones. Uh, so this gives a different perspective on distances between points. OK. And, and what's the intuition why the second one is better? Is it just in the problem definition? The, the... Yeah, it's. Um... OK, OK, if it's in the problem definition, then uh, OK, I'm going to do that. I mean, you could probably also try to do some optimization directly in that space. But here, our goal was also to show that doing this embedding is somehow uh, advantageous, and that if you consider the, the geometry of this embedding, then you get nice results. Um, I'm not saying that this is the best way to solve that problem in a way, if you want. Um, that's an, a good way to represent that grid in some way here. But if you want just to do a path planning problem, you could also just assume that you don't want to go for an embedding. OK, but in the objective function on the top, the distance, which distance is it? So it's the one uh, when you go back to the original space. So it's the distance here, the Euclidean one. OK, then I'm a bit puzzled, but uh, <laughs> never mind. OK, you can take it as a very uh, toyish example, Okay, I have to say. Uh, this, I mean, we have also a point particle robots. This is not something that you have in real world. So take it as a toy example that is aimed at showing that um, like optimizing in the hyperbolic first is possible and it gives nice results and you have better results if you use the geometry of your manifold when you do so. Okay, then, uh, then I'm with you. Thank you very much. Thanks. There was another question or you were the only one? Not in the room. OK. OK, so then I move on. OK, so um, basically, as I just said, I mean, those are a bit uh, toyish examples. They are point particle robots. They are robots in 2D. Uh, so ultimately, what we want to do is to go for uh, real robots. So here, I'm going to show you a real world experiment uh, on the RMR6 robot that we have here uh, at KIT. Um, so this is very preliminary work. The recording that I'm going to show you here dates from Monday. Um, so we are now really working on that, on moving those approaches on those real robots. Um, so the idea here is that we have that robot, and uh, we would like him to be able to open a dishwasher. So the door that you see here is the door of um, a dishwasher. And to do so, uh, what the robot is going to do is that it approaches the hand from the dishwasher. When it detects contacts with the dishwasher, it slides the hand up until it reaches the handle. And when it feels contact between the hand and the handle, it's going to close the hand in order to grasp. So what is critical here is that we have to choose the orientation of the hand of the robot or the orientation of the wrist here. 
So this is what we aim at optimizing. So the idea here is that we want to minimize the distance between the handle and the hand. So that because we want the robot to grasp the handle, so it means that you have to have contact between this hand and the handle. Um, we want to do it with low external forces. This is because if you have high external forces, actually we may break the hand of the robot, which is quite fragile. So ultimately you want to have contact with the dishwasher, but you don't want to push hard on the dishwasher. And finally, we want to have a high volume force manipulability ellipsoid. This is to, um, so that the robot grasps the handle and then it has the ability of providing some force in order uh, to pull the handle and to open the dishwasher. Um, so you will see here first the initialization on the robot. So you see here that the initialization fails because um, the robot has some contact between the finger and the handle and this triggers closing the hand. And this one is a Gabo run, and you see that here the robot grasps uh, successfully the handle. So what you can observe here is that the orientation, so here you can observe it mostly at the wrist, uh, changes, also you see the behavior of the elbow changes between the runs. And you see that we try different orientation. Uh, so this one is a run that fails. So actually we had to stop it because the finger were stuck. So we had really high external forces and um, yeah, we cannot allow this. So you see here uh, how the BO is actually exploring and exploiting in order to get a successful grasping of the hand. Um, so we have here uh, 15 trials. I'm leaving the full video. And then at the end, you will see the, the final, so the best run of the 15. Um, which actually is going to allow us to open this dishwasher. So this is again a failure where we cannot uh, leave the robot have too, uh, too much contact in order to avoid breaking the hand. Here is one where we can close all the fingers um, so you see that there is actually multiple ways uh, to just fail at this task. And here is the optimum that we obtain after 15 iteration of this GAPO on the robot, and we are finally able uh, to open this washer. Okay. Um, so basically in this part of the talk, I showed you how uh, we can generalize Riemannian um, I mean, squared exponential and matron kernel to the remaining setting. Um, and basically we are now able to have uh, Bayesian optimization approaches that works on all the manifolds that you can see here on the right. Um, it provides us in general with faster convergence, better accuracy and lower solution variance if we compare to Euclidean uh, Bayesian optimization approaches on those remaining manifold um, based data. Um, so now for the last few minutes that I have, I just want to spend some time on um, a problem that is um, widely, I mean, th that's a wide problem in BO. We all know that BO performances decrease in high dimensional problems. And I just want to discuss briefly how we can exploit the structure of high dimensional problems on many and manifolds in order to uh, try to do better in high dimensions. Um, so the idea here is that we also have a lot of parameters that belong to high dimensional domain manifolds. So both in robotics and also in machine learning. So examples uh, in the sphere, we have high dimensional directional data, some shape representation, some skeletal models, and uh, typically on the symmetric positive definite manifold side, we have some inertia matrix that can be really high dimensional and some controller parameters. So depending on which control parameter we um, we consider we can have really uh, high dimensional control gains. Um, so in order to show you how we can exploit um, the structure of the problem in that setup, I just want to focus on this example. So you imagine you have a robot that needs to push those blocks along the table. So you want to have a stiffness that is high enough so that the robot is able to push those blocks. Um, and the idea here is that actually I can choose this stiffness, but I can also choose this one. 
And in terms of being able to push the blocks, it won't change anything because the only direction that matters is the horizontal part here. So it means that here, um, the cost function evolves on, along a low dimensional latent space of these manifolds. So it doesn't uh, depend on the stiffness along that vertical direction. And on top of this, this latent space actually preserves the manifold structure because I can go from a, a stiffness matrix, which is, um, for example, a three by three SPD matrix, and then I remove the vertical dimension and I obtain a two by two SPD matrix. So we are actually on the same type of manifolds. You can observe that in other problems. So here you have an objective function on the sphere and uh, the value of the objective doesn't vary along the X1 axis. So you can simply represent your problem on a lower dimensional manifold of the same type. So here on the circle. What is interesting here is that actually this is exactly the same assumption that is made in some high dimensional view approach. So if you take here this picture from the Rambo paper, uh, it simply assumes that the objective function doesn't vary along X2 and varies only along X1. And you just want to consider X1, then you compute it. So I just want here to briefly show you um, uh, the high dimensional GABO algorithm that we developed for that kind of settings, where we considered that we have a function that is on the high dimensional manifolds, but it satisfies the low dimensional assumption. And we assume that it finally uh, lays on a low dimensional manifolds of the same type of the original one. So the idea here is that we want basically to learn a mapping to this latent space and also a model for our objective function on this latent space in a joint manner. So concerning the mapping, it means that we are simply um, considering a nested mapping. So here, instead of having our full sphere, we consider a nested sphere, which is in this case, a circle. Then we can project our point on this circle and by rescaling the radius of the circle, we actually obtain the sphere S1. Um, so the idea here is that this mapping is uh, structure preserving, is based on nested manifolds and it's parametric. So in that case, it simply depends on that vector V, which gives you uh, how you place your circle on the sphere and then the radius that you choose for the circle. So the idea after that is that uh, we define a geometry over Gaussian process on our low dimensional manifolds so the kernel is based on the mapping that we have here. And um, so that's the mapping of the point from our high dimensional Riemann manifolds to the low dimensional Riemann manifolds. So the idea is that you can uh, optimally uh, optimize jointly the parameters of the kernel and of the mapping in a joint manner, um, classically via maximum likelihood estimation. And then you obtain your model of the objective function on the low dimensional manifold. Then um, you want to evaluate the utility of those candidate points on the low dimension manifolds. So you do this by optimizing um, the, opti the acquisition function on the low dimension space using again, those optimization on the manifold techniques. That allows you to find your next query point and then you want to evaluate your objective function. So you have to go back to the original high dimension space and you simply use the pseudo inverse mapping to do this. Um, so here there is um, a very similar method for the symmetric positive definite matrix manifold, but I won't explain here. So just go to check the paper if you want to have more detail on that. Um, so again, some convergent statistics. So here we um, optimize some function on the sphere manifold of dimension 50, which intrinsically were lying on the sphere dimension of dimension five. Uh, so these are our convergence for the product of sign. Uh, so you see HD Gabo is basically the one here. Um, and we compare with other high dimensional BO methods that are all in Euclidean space, so your BO dropout and Rambo here. Um, we also compare with the original Gabo that doesn't consider the high uh, dimensional structure that we have in that problem. And you see that it also performs actually very well. Um, another one, so here is for the Rosenbach function. So you see here that the CRBO is actually outperforming the HD Gabor approach, but um, in this case, the CRBO was actually performing really bad. So the HD Gabor is always able to find a solution that is uh, satisfying in some way. Um, the same for the SPD manifolds. So here, the SPD manifold of dimension 10 is actually 55 parameters to optimize. 
and we go to a space, um, so a speed of dimension three, which is only six parameters to optimize. And you can see again that here we have a good performance for the HD couple approach um, and in both cases. So HD Gabo basically consistently converges fast and provides good optimizers for all the function, even if sometimes it is outperformed for, by some other approaches. Okay. So I'm a bit out of time, I think. So it's good that I'm arriving to the conclusion. So what I wanted to convey in that talk is that basically considering the geometry of your search base is highly beneficial. So if you have a search space, you know that it has a particular geometry, it's a good idea to use it into your BO algorithm. Um, I mostly showed you that for some robotics application and some robotics space, but I think that this is certainly not limited to robotics. So there is a lot of other domains which have also those geometries that may come and arise. And in general, I think it's a good idea to use your geometry if you can. Um, another thing is that this is not limited to BO neither. So there is various algorithm and application that are benefiting from the introduction of geometry. So here you have all, um, this is all recent papers from one to two years, three years ago also. And all of them are actually considering the geometry of their data, the geometry of the search space. And some of them also have um, geometry that are learned and it always helps the consider algorithm. And just to take a closer look on Bayesian optimization in general for robotic manipulation. So what I showed you today is including geometry awareness, but actually robotics problem are very complicated. Um, so as you could see, like if you want to interact with human or in general in your, your workspace, you have to have a safe algorithm. Uh, in robotics, we often have simulators which are not super precise, but we can also use them. So we can also make use of multi-fidelity approaches in BO. We need some robust methods. Uh, we have a lot of contacts, so we may have um, objective functions that are actually varying in a stepwise manner. So we may need some heter heterostatic processes. We also may want to have some reset-free algorithm where we don't always try the full um, trial again, but we just optimize for a subset of it. And there are a lot of more things to do. So there are individual works for all of these points, but I think we are still missing a full framework that is really allowing us to do performing BO for robotic manipulation in general. Um, so with that, I want to thank you for your attention and I would be really happy to take questions if there are some. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the talk. That was a great talk. So uh, yeah, with the time is uh, out, but uh, yeah, uh, we have some time for uh, more detailed questions. Uh, please stick around if you uh, want to participate. Uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, official time for the seminar is uh, is done. Any questions? Yeah. I have uh, I have one. If, can can you come back to the slide where you were showing the lines wrapping around the the cycle when you were trying to link the naive generalization of the squared exponential kernel to the one yes. uh, you call the proper generalization? Uh, yes. Before. This one. Yes. I think, yeah, I, I think that's quite interesting. I'd like to understand that a bit uh, a bit better because in the previous slide, just before this one, you were saying you can truncate the, the submission to maybe 20 terms. Mm -hmm. But uh, the issue when you do that is basically that you're, you're not working with a Gaussian process that has infinite degrees of freedom anymore. It's more Bayesian linear regression that you're doing in the end is just have 15 or 20 degrees of freedom in your mm -hmm. model. Whereas right. in your, what you call the naive approach was still an object that was infinite dimensional in its randomness, right? So, um, so I'm not sure if the, the one that I called naive really has that high, um, that infinite dimension. 
think, I mean, as it's not valid for all the length scale, I think you have definitely an intrinsic problem there. But provided that your parameter beta is uh, yeah. is large enough, then you had something that was positive definite. Yes. Um, yes. I, I would expect, since it's a kernel that depends on the distance between the between the points, uh, the space it generates. I think like the RKHS is not going to be finite dimensional. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah. it, in a way it is more interesting than the other ones where you have to truncate the the sum. Mm -hmm. Could we? Instead of having just the first term of, term of the things wrapping around the circle, could could we add more and truncate the sum uh, later on in the generalization? Um, I'm not sure if it's actually. I think it's exactly what that thing does if you you truncate it, right? Because each of your term is infinite dimensional, no? Yes, but this is different from truncating based on the eigenfunctions of the Laplace operator. Ah, okay, yeah. Um, so you mean if you take this formula here? Yes, this formula here will have a finite... Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the space behind that is just the order of the truncation, whereas in the other slide, I think it's yeah. more interesting. Um, so but I'm not sure if you would be positive definite if you truncate at... Uh, different levels. So that was the, it was a long preamble, but that was basically the question. Can, can you truncate wherever you want in the second sum on the next slide? Um, so actually I didn't try that. That's a good question. Um, so I think when you truncate here, so I have to tell you I'm a practitioner, right? So this full theory here uh, is more made by my uh, mathematician colleagues. So. Uh, maybe take what I say with one step back. Uh, so from my point of view, actually, when you go, uh, you go in, into the terms that are higher of that uh, sum here, your terms are becoming very small. And when I'm computing my kernel, I barely see the difference by adding one or 10 more terms or by just not adding them. So I estimate that even if you're not in a high dimension, uh, infinite dimensional space anymore, uh, my kernel is actually valid for everything that I want to do. So I don't really see the problem in a practical point of view, if you see what but, I mean. Yeah, but if you have, uh, let's say, 20 basis functions and 20 observation points, mm -hmm. if you don't have observation noise, then you know perfectly what the underlying function is, right? So your, I would expect your certainty in base up to, to collapse if you don't have observation noise, so in practice, which would be I a didn't practical see, problem. I didn't see anything collapsing that I can tell okay. you. Um, yeah. Um, I think the point that those terms are becoming very fast, very small, and then computationally it doesn't make any difference anymore. OK. At least that's how I see it in, in when I have those things coded and you try to put more or less um, of those basis function. For me, you put 20 or you put 100, I see exactly the same results in my algorithm. Okay, and um, the thing you show with the line wrapping around the cycle, how does it look in higher dimension? Do you have a similar interpretation for the sphere, for example? Um, so you probably have something similar, yes. We don't have plots for that. So that would be actually nice to try uh, plotting. But I think the circle is a, is a nice case because you can really see that um, if you want, you can s interpret this as really periodic function. Um, that's why you have the circle. So the interpretation is especially easy for this circle. For the sphere, I cannot tell you exactly how that looks, but it's probably going into the same kind of direction. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Can I ask a question as well? So um, you showed one of your toy examples where you were optimizing over, over a sphere. And mm -hmm. you could either use the, right, the, the sort of the standard base opt, or you could do it um, over the over the, the manifold. So, is, is there a way of like working out if you're on a manifold? So, imagine like you could just be optimizing that and not know um, that it would be better represented on on a sphere, for example. So, have you have you come across any work like that? So, like optimizing, but kind of learning if there is a structure in the data. Mm -hmm. um... 
so I think in Bayesian optimization, uh, this is not directly made yet in terms of remaining manifolds at least. Um, then in the last uh, works that I showed, um, like this one, um, those two works here um, are basically sums that are learning the structure of the data. So typically here in that image, we have the data here in gray and it learns that the, the shortest path through those data is actually, so the geodesic is the green line uh, as opposed to the um, Euclidean one. So these are some tools. And um, so here you can learn the, the underlying structure of your data. Um, so we could actually think, I mean, we could think about putting such methods to co um, couple it with Bayesian optimization to get something similar. But as far as I know, this is not uh, done yet, at least not in that way. Thank you very much. Any other question? Okay. Perhaps if not, then we can uh, uh, we can close the talk and. Uh, Thank again, uh, Noemi, for an excellent Thank talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.